tonight, uh, our guest speaker is uh, John Haynes. He's uh, a very exper highly experienced uh, Special Forces operator. He served at four already for quite a long time. Um, he also served within the medical formation. Uh, at, uh, I specifically said to him, I don't know all his paraphernalia and all his exact details. So I asked him to present his, his uh, a short uh, feedback of, of his military career to us in case I would have left, left out some of the more important stuff. So John, it is my honor to, to welcome you here and be good to have for you. Paratroopers, ladies, I assume you haven't got any jumps behind you. Paratroopers <laughs> <laughs> and ladies, um, it is a, indeed a privilege to come and stand in front of you now and um, uh, give, and present what I'm going to present to you and in front of tasters like um, like granny glasses. I think we must be made. Um, in front of General Rudney, it might be an eye-opener what I have to say, but later on, so please. I'm, I've been on pension now for three years, so I'm, I'm, I'm out of the system. So you can't touch me anymore. <laughs> Okay, what um, brief history on my uh, military career. I started off in the Rhodesian, in the Rhodesian forces um, with the SAS in, 19, in 1970. I served there for 10 years. Um, then the SAS migrated down to South Africa through to uh, through to, to um, Durban, we became six six recce on the bluff. Um, the Sluice Scouts migrated down to uh, where was it on? Dukaduka, uh, initially. They became three recce. Um, this didn't last very long. Uh, there was a lot of am uh, animation um, between the. The South Africans and the Rhodesians, because the Rhodesians came down and we, we filled positions in the South African structures that were um, not really there. So there was a lot of uh, animosity between us. And by, by, by the end of the first year, 1981, um, a lot of the Rhodesians had actually resigned and gone into Civil Street. So there was only a handful of us at, um, from the SAS that were left over. And um, I so it would be good for me to, to go down to four recce because I was a qualified diver anyway, which I'll get into later on in the presentation. And they, <coughs> being seaborne a unit, I decided that's the place to go. So in 1991, I went down to um, four recce, served there for 10 years. <coughs> and was it 10 years? Yes, served there. And then in 1997, I was offered a post as the RSM of 7 Medical Battalion, which is the medical, me medical unit that gave, gave medical um, support to not only the parachute battalion, but to the Special Forces. They required an, an RSM down there. And I was um, seconded to 7 Medical Battalion, being medically qualified as well. Uh, they accepted me there. And then later on, when the integration came about in, in uh, 2000, and um, someone, someone in their wisdom, sitting at Sam's headquarters, decided to make me not an RSM, but to make me a brigade. A brigade, then formation of the major. In their wisdom, I don't know. Anyway, I became formation of the major. And then I felt that it was right that I should actually do a transfer into the medical, um, medical fraternity, which I did. But I still had a lot of contact with Special Forces, mainly um, <coughs> uh, Foriki and Nongabang, being di diving qualified. I used to go and assist them with the diving courses down there. And um, now I'm on pension, 2015. <laughs> been on pension now for, for three years. Um, I do miss the, miss the forces, specifically the individuals that you got to, to meet 
and, and grow up with and mix with. So now, I'm going to give talk about um, the training that we did in at 4 um, And I'm going to concentrate more on, on the lighter side. Um, nothing serious. There's no, there's no operations that, we, that we're going to discuss tonight. And I'm going to tonight. We maybe touch on one or two. May not was here last, last month. I'll touch on that one because it was involved um, um, small boats. And um, <coughs> yes. We start, we start off in, in Langevin. What I'm going to do now is going to give you an overview of, of those who do not know where Langevin is or where for it reconnaissance is. It's in Langevin. Did you know? Uh, I assume we all know where Langevin is. There's Langevin town over here. It's Langevin. Um, this is the Langevin Lagoon. You have... Um, I would never remember the name of that island. Scarpin Island, in front of Langevin, <coughs> you have the peninsula, where the military base, the operational base was of Donkerkut. Donkerkut is in that position over there, and Saldana is just to the north, Saldana Bay, in that area there. Okay, just to zoom in on the map, this is Donkerkut itself. Where we have the, the operational hangars, the operational jetty, the work the work jetty, which is an old um, whaling a whaler that was that was sunk there and has been filled with rubble and concrete. Um, so this is the operational um, hangars over there. This area over here, the one that I am going to be concentrating on is the training for two commando, the training commando, which I was um, the, the warrant officer in charge. Just to zoom out a bit, the total area at Donkerkut is, there's Donkerkut over here, just to the north is Salamanda Bay, then we have a, um, a boat hangar, where all the boats were stored, and just north of that there's a, a hotel, Salamanda Hotel. In the old waiting days, that was, an, that was an operating hotel that tourists used to go to, but you can only get to that by boat. Mahoni. Sorry? This is now called Mahoni. Mahoni, yeah. Okay, that's the, the main entrance into the, um, into the base at Nangabad itself, the admin headquarters. The memorial outside, the, the headquarters where they have their uh, memorial parades. We're going to start off the first course that we, we presented in, at Donkakas. The first one was the seaborne orientation, which is two weeks. And on that course we did um, things like river crossings, kayaks, inflatable um, zodiacs. Initially, there's a lot of people, a lot of, a lot of the groups that came in, Majority of the people had problems in swimming and the confidence in the water. So the first couple of days, push it through to a week, we used to do a lot of swimming in the, um, the pool, which I might add was a 25-meter uh, lake pool. It was an um, Olympic-sized pool. Now these are the guys that are, we've, we've started off with training. I'm going to sidestep every now and again when we get to a, to a, to a slide and add in, add in a little bit of humor. Donkerkut, that area is well known for the snakes. Uh, specifically puff adders and cape cobras. There's not a day that goes past that the Donkerkut <coughs> area that you don't come across one of those snakes. Now when you've got a, a group of people in a pool like this, to motivate them, one of our instructors would find the puff adder coming up from the jetty. And we'd just drop it in next to the side of the pool there. Now the snake's not going to swim into the center of the pool, it's going to you know, stay along the side of the pool. 
So that is serious motivation to give him a call to the other Okay, while we're going back there, this is the, um, the pool that later on when I talk about um, the, uh, the diving courses. Is the pool that we do a lot of our training in. And at the back there is a, um, a high, high building. And inside that building is a, is a glass tank, three meter deep, three meter uh, wide, and four, four meter depth. So it's three meter depth, four meter wide, and three meter in length with glass panels. We'll get on to that a bit later. Okay, as we talk about river crossings, this is the Bird River. Close to us, and we all, we've all done this, river crossings. I assume we have. You um, waterproof your equipment and swim across the Bird River. The funny thing is, here, yeah, you don't always get to the point on the other side that you want to, because the river flows, can flow. So that was, that was another um, funny thing, getting a group of people to a single point on the other side of the river. Um, we did, on the original course, obviously there's a lot of kayak work. We used clippers, which is a very robust and reliable um, kayak. Then we go on to using the inflatables. Then we would go down to Yulo's boss, we'd give them an inflatable, they, they would inflate it. The thing is, we didn't give them engines. They were paddles. So they would spend a day or two launching from the coast, from the beach, to sea, and then, then recovering back onto the coast again. But there's, there's a trick to this. If you notice, um, any of you, if you've ever been to the coast, the biggest wave is always the seventh wave that comes in. You can count them. And um, this, is, this is the main trick when you're, when you're launching out to sea in a boat. You've got to count your wave rotation as it comes in. Okay, the next module that we would go on to would be uh, module one. And in this course, we would do surface swimming, small boat coxswain skills, kayaks, inflatables, and beach landings. Now, this is where we go to a stage further with the kayak. Um, once you've capsized, with equipment inside, it's very difficult to rectify the boat again. And should you manage to do that, then you've still got to climb back on top of the kayak again. As you can see there, um, the net, oh, the guy's already in it, but you always, the guy would, would sit at the, the lie on the back, wrap his legs and arms around the kayak to stabilize it um, in the front, and the guy at the stern will climb on and get in, and then they would do vice versa, then the guy in the front would get in. This is once again on the Berg River, doing riverine work. You see the, the camouflage on the kayak. But the problem with this, when you're going for long distances down a river, the terrain changes often. So you, you therefore have to change the camouflage on your kayak as you're going down. So the best way to work is you don't, you work during, during night, night time, you always have in a flowing river, you have um, um, islands of uh, weed flowing down. So you actually flow, flow down with the river. You don't paddle, you break the paddles in half, you keep a low profile, and you come down with the, the re weeds that is flowing down the river. This is the, the naked version of the Zodiac Mark III that we used. Specifically in riverine work and in, in, in the submarine work. It takes a crew of, of three plus four combatants on board. That's in the naked version in the store. This is the version where we have the, the camouflage net which, flow, which is allowed to um, flow into the water on either side to break the profile of it. You have the personal equipment in the, in the, in the boat. And then your boat equipment. Inside your boat equipment, which is a, a sealed container, a type container, you have your, your, your radios, your spare batteries, your flares, 
Your survival equipment is all you need. And if, I, if I look carefully, that is a simple 30 HF radio. This is the guys doing practicing in the, in the um, Clan William Dam. And they don't look very professional, but um, that's a start. <laughs> Once I finished with fresh water, fresh water training in riverine work and in dams, then we go up to sea. Here we are traveling from, from Donker Cup, we're traveling around into open sea, then we're going to come into U-boat post. You'll notice that bar there. There is always a safety boat, a barracuda, um, in training, just in case um, there's a, a, an incident and they need to be recovered. Once around that U-boat post, then we start off with your beach landings. Um, which is hilarious. Because if you don't time it and you come in with the wave and slide up the beach, the boat comes to a steady halt. If you jump the wave as you hit the beach, the, beach, the boat is stuck onto the, onto the sand and everybody flies forward. Okay, but uh, after, after two weeks of training, we managed to get this right. And this is another shot of them doing a beach landing. And the assault teams are out in all-round defense. This one, once the assault teams are out of the, out of the boat and they've gone into the hinterland, now the boat teams must launch and go back out to sea to a, to a specific, specified um, holding pattern. If it's, if it's a, a quick attack that the te teams are doing, but if it's a, a day or two that the teams are going to be on land, those boats will return and RV with either the surface craft, whatever surface craft, surface craft they are working with. And the last year. That is not the way to do it. <laughs> but there's, there's more interesting shots coming up later. Remember I told you there's every seventh wave is a big wave. So before you launch, count. <laughs> this boat here, uh, this shot here is, I just wanted to point out the, the, the ferries in the background, the, the Friedenbergers that we had. The ferries that used to take us from Longobahn to Blankercut. But we'll speak more about those a little bit later. Okay, the next, next course was Module 2, Operational Coxswains. Now we're getting a, bit, get, getting a bit more serious. We're talking about a lot of miles out to sea and when everybody on board must know field maintenance of those engines. There's no tiffies about 20 miles out to sea. There's no tiffies there to fix the engine. You must do it yourself. Uh, we do um, coxswain, coxswain training and, and crew skills. We do formations. Uh, coxing informations, we do coastal, coastal navigation. We're talking up to 15 nautical miles out to sea, coastal navigation. And then beach landings um, and launching. Good oh, fast for me this one. Mm -hmm. Okay, we've initially we had. We started off with the inflatable boats, and then we went on to the barracudas, the solid, the hot, solid hull boats, the deep V boats. Now, before we carry on with the slide presentation, does anybody have an idea where these boats come from? The sea. Well done. Before, before they get into the sea. These boats are the exact same design that the, um, the Tell Sharks board used when they used to go out from, in, you know, from Durban and they used to go out and use it, clear, the, yes. clear the nets. These are the exact same design boats. And this is where we did our initial training 
our, our seaborne training or launch training and processing training out in the sea. We got it from them. So we, this is just a modified design of this of the um, shark's wood boats. John, are they locally manufactured? Yes, they're locally yeah. manufactured. I think it's still now also. No, they they um, in Durban. They manufacture yeah, in yeah. Durban, yeah. Um Are there any other questions in this in this regard? We, there, were, there were two size boats. There was the 18 footer and there's the 21 footer. And uh, the only difference is you can see the, su the superstructure is built up on, on, on the barracudas that we have as opposed to the portable. In there we had the, the, the um, all your radio equipment was mounted, your antennas, all your gauges for the engines and all the rest of it. This is the formations that we would go into, in this case the V formation. Um, these are the 21 footers that you can see here. There, there are the new generation semi rigids that they've got currently in, in Special Forces. Barracudas are still used because it's an excellent boat. This particular boat that we have here, that you see here, is called the, um, the Avalanche. This is a 30 foot um, craft which is designed in the States, and our boats were designed and built in the States. They're a cigar boat, it's a double hull, and they're used for racing. We had a group of people that went over to the States, they came back. Um, we brought back four of these boats, which were excellent. They had two 350 horsepower inboard outboard engines, and in the racing, racing field they were excellent. They're lightweight, they're fast. But now we start mounting right, um, the radar on the back, and five of, five of gr grounding machine guns on it. You've got a bigger crew, you've got to carry other packs with it. So now we had a problem. The, um, the, the inboard outboard engines had the power once they were on the plane, but to get that boat on the plane was another story. It was a major nightmare. So through our, our um, research and development program that we have at Fall, we decided no, we're going to take those inboard motors out and on the, on the stern of the boat, with a metal framework, we are going to mount outboard engines. And we mounted 250 horsepower Yamaha engines. And it was day and night. The moment you put power onto the engine, the nose lifted, dropped, and you were on the plane almost immediately. Now it's strange to note that after that, the Nyamakuris, the Navy boats, patrol boats, they changed to that configuration as well. And if you look around the Emirates, if you go to Qatar, and hell, go to Namibia, the Navy in Namibia, they've got similar uh, patrol boats as this, but they have now four 300 horsepower engines, up the engines, four. Amazing. So I think I think we did something good in our career. <coughs> okay, this is just the new generation um, Dorado that they put alongside the operational jetty. This is the Dorado in, in action. Then we go back to the 18 foot of Barracuda. Now we're going to do some beach landings. Beach landing one. Once you've hit the beach, remember I said earlier, it's timing. When you come in with a wave, you come in with the wave. You don't jump the wave and hit the beach. 
And um, I don't know if anybody knows Kirkkriya. We were doing it outside, just, just off. Um, it's a big hotel restaurant, they got there now, big hotel system. Um, Greek, the Greek hotel. Greek, no, no, no. Greek came in. Kirk came in with his boat. And he, did, he, did, well, he didn't jump away, he didn't do anything. It was all perfect. Except full throttle. He went up, hit the beach, <coughs> up the beach, and he hit the, the hinterland. And the nose of the boat dug into the into the dune, so everybody ended up onto the dune anyway. <laughs> practice comes perfection. Okay, once the, the raiding team have left, then you've got the team of three to turn that boat around. And then that guy's going to blow, he's going to burst the blood vessel so soon if he carries on like that. But, um, Obviously, we can still utilize the team before they, they disappear to turn the boat around and launch it back into the water. This is the, the new generation team moving. <laughs> and then going out into, into the surf line. You'll notice there's always, there's always one tippy that, that, that loses out on everything. That's the guy that's got to jump into the water in front of the boat and hold the bell painter and, and bounce around just to ensure that the nose of the boat is continuously in, into the surf um, breaking in otherwise it's going to capsize Are you still using that method? Yes What, what method would you suggest? Easy! I'm not a surf man so I'm not a surf man we, we hold the boat, we, 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 we dump it, we turn the boat, those boats, everybody gets on. You yes. start your motors, everybody gets on, and your skipper controls it. Yes. That's it's, very that's, that's it's very much what's happening there. there. It's very much what is happening there. Um, okay, he's, a, he's a, um, the number four in the water. The number three is, start is with the engines to ensure they start. The coxswain starts the boat. And um, as they start moving forward, it takes tension up on the bow rope, and the guy comes alongside the boat, they just grab him and pull him in. So this is like you maybe mentioned that. We're not, we're not, going, we're not going fishing on them. John, it's maybe just important to say all these photos are in the day. I've never been there where I've seen day training. It's all at night. It's all in the yes. dark. Yes, very good. And uh, yeah. this gives you an idea of of, uh, of, of systems and process. But, uh, that that that's a bug you're doing on that day. This is the training that we do during the day. Once we qualify, we obviously got to do it at night as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But on all operations, all training is at night. No, no, let's see what's going on. And we skip on here. This is a historical picture of this. I'll tell you why. There's no way, there's actually five boats on the beach they're going to launch now. Since that photograph was taken, you will never get that amount of boats um, in that, um, what's the word, in that configuration waiting to go out. Tactically wise, it's not a good idea, one. But that's, that's, that's a perfect photo. There were actually five boats that um, on the beach at the time then. Okay, this is another boat. They just dropped a team, they're coming off into the hinterland. The boat teams are starting to turn the boat around. Here we go. Not a bad exit. It's coming on. Whoa, a little bit higher. A little bit higher. A little bit higher. <laughs> that, that, that particular exercise there, that, that, they had a very soft landing. The one photograph I've got, the length of the boat sticking up is the same height above the wave below it. So it went very high into the air. And as it came down, 
the tail, the, the, the stern just hit, hit the water, just sank down, the nose went forward, and off they went. It was the softest landing they've had in their language. Maybe we should train our, change our, tra our training um, techniques. In the compartment. 
Now, where we normally sleep is they put wooden planks on the tubes, <coughs> the pedo tubes, the three layers, the two bottom center and the top, with uh, foam mattresses on top. That's not too bad. The bottom and the middle and the middle layer are cut. Excellent. But if you get to the top ramp, the, the top ramp layer, that's where all the all the uh, newbies and the and the juniors sleep. Because the condensation that forms in the inside of the submarine is yeah. like a rainforest inside there. <laughs> so not only are you on the top there, you've got your boogie out as well that you've got to somehow put that up just to keep dry while you're traveling in the submarine. Now in this, this situation here we've got two inflatable uh, zodiac mark trees on, on, on the casing. Now the record for, I'm going to mention it, Baynard's, Baynard's story, when we deployed them from the time that the, um, the EXO gave a command, low pressure blow, and the front the casing opened, the front hatch opened on the casing. It took six minutes to take out, folded up the two inflatables, the Mark III inflatables, put onto the casing, lay them out, assemble them, inflate them, and all the equipment, both equipment on top, and all the operators that went, went with us. Six minutes from the time that hatch opened for us to say, we're ready to go. Which I thought was quite impressive. From the top of the fin there, down to the, the bow of the, the submarine, is a cable. And I'm not quite sure what they use it for, but when, we, when we're working on the, on the casing, we use it, uh, once we've inflated the boat or rolled out the boat, there's the bow painter with the hook on, we clip it onto the, onto the cable. In case of ac ac um, bad weather, the wave breaks over, we can still recover the boat. So now, why not? We're sitting in the boat, we're ready to dive, that cable is above us. We unclip. Before, so we, so we, before we unclip, we confirm the bearing and distance to target. We unclip, the submarine does a static dive. And as the water starts flushing across the casing, you grab the cable and you push the boat off. You push the boat off. You push the boat off. <laughs> because what happened in training in, in the Tonka Cut was um, they went down a little bit too fast and the uh, cable came down on top of the inflatable boat and we all started diving down with the submarine. Fortunately, the commander was looking through the periscope, he saw what was happening, and he gave the command uh, LP blow to bring it up again. So, uh, funny things like this do happen. Then, I worked with the Air Force Obviously, we parachute this. We do a lot of a lot of water jumps into the lagoon itself. Um, the tourists love this because they used to all form up on the beach and take photos and all the rest of it as we were jumping. And as you can see, we've also got a lot of um, safety boats in the water. I don't know if anybody knew Gavin Christie, but that's that's him there, landing next to the ferry. I thought that was a classic shot, so I put it here. But um, before we carry on, let's go back to Gavin. Another, another funny story here. One guy, he came out and he had a, he had a screamer. And he just did nothing. He just came down with a screamer. And he hit the water. The 50 foot ferry was also there in support to the, to the jumping. Now, this guy missed the 50 foot ferry by about, I don't know, 10, 15 meters. And he hit, and I think he bounced in the seabed and came back up again. He was happy. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure if, he, if he'd come down and hit that ferry, he would have gone straight through the deck into the, into the engine room. <laughs> This jump, we're not 
this this particular photograph, but this is um, C-130 out at sea. They've got a 21 foot um, barracuda on a pallet, and they're doing they're doing um, air drops. Now what happens is, you are, I don't have to explain to you guys the full with air drops, but this particular jump, um, myself and Craig Kennedy, we were actually organizing the training for that week. And we, we don't particularly like static line, we prefer free fall. Free fall money. So we were in the aircraft with our free fall shoots on, and um, can, the, the canopies deployed. They started to deploy, the canopy started to deploy. But before I pulled the pallet up the back of the aircraft, it came like this on the, on the back and it jammed. And um, could hear the end of the pilot, he was concerned because he was revving a bit now to try and get more power. And as the, as the, car, the shoots were getting bigger and bigger, the nose was going down and down. And uh, that, was, that was at sea. So I thought, there's no way I'm going to die. I'm going to die down in this boat. I've got a free for shoot. But then the tech, the tech guy, um, the aircraft tech, he grabbed a hammer, not a hammer, a chopper, and he whacked something. I don't know what he whacked, but it worked. And that pallet went straight out of the <laughs> So it, it's, um, it's a lot of, uh, I can say, a lot, a lot of humor that we, we don't think about um, once we finish our service. Or maybe we do think about it. That's what keeps us going. Um, the boat and, and the canopy. What's missing there? Jumpers. jumpers. Mm -hmm. Where's the crew and the jumpers? <laughs> okay, what happened once was um, we, we did this. The wind was pumping. <coughs> the boat came down, it hit the ground. The, the, the canopies were still deployed and they started dragging it towards the rocks. And now the, the guys on the boats, the safety boats, they had to run, they had to drive, come next to the next to the pallet and with knives cut cut the stops to stop the um, uh, canopies dropping and uh, dragging it onto the rocks. Those guys needed the metal and we mentioned that. Did they ever get? Okay, also with the, um, with the Air Force, every now and again we'd go to Bloemfontein and do Halo Refresher. Why are we on this photograph? Um, who's done Pathfinder's course? Who's done Pathfinder's course? <coughs> In, 19, in 1975, I came down from Odisha, from the SAS, and did a free fall course in, in Bluffin Bay. And once I got there, I realized, man, it's not a free fall course, it's a pathfinder's course. So that was the very first pathfinder's course that we did that Bluffin Bay um, presented, was in, in 1975, January, Fe uh, February, March, February, March, 1975. So, um, we are also not only are we seaborne qualified, we halo qualified, and we were on the very first um, course that presented tandem, tandem master courses as well. While we were on tandem masters, we were um, American Marines, instructors, retired. And they came out. Now, in tandem master, you, we all know that you're going to jump with the packs in front of you. But now, when you're going to pack, jump with a, with, a, with a box in front of you. And we all know the um, clothing boxes that you get in the stores. It's probably about as wide as a table and about this long and about this deep. We, uh, 
that was part of the training as well. You lie on top of this thing, you are put onto this box, they roll you to the end of the ramp, and you look down, and just your nose sticking on the box. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and you're at 15,000 feet. And when the guy slaps you on the arm, you know, here we go. And I, you go out. And um, the drill is, the dispatcher pulls your, your drone, your drone, your drone shoot out. You go out, as you fall like this, your drone falls, uh, your drone shoot comes over like that, it takes the air, and you swing around like this. And the deck out of attitude, that's when you release your, your, your drone, your drone shoot, and in theory, you come down back underneath the, underneath the camera. But you still got this box strapped to your front here. <laughs> and um, the very first one I did, my attitude wasn't quite right. And when I, when I released the, the drug chute, this box went away from me and came and slapped me in the face. The whole life inside of my face was just one graze. <laughs> so I heard, only heard later that the Americans that were training us they used us as piggy bits. Piggy bits. <laughs> <laughs> so we went back, back home and sorted out the train again. <laughs> okay, another, another method of getting equipment which you would know, you would go out to a door bundle, it's an inflatable boat rolled up, um, with a cap tree on it, you would dive out of the aircraft behind it. Three, four in with the cap tree fired, you would fire your canopy and you would land next to the, the bundle in the water. And there's a release uh, lever that you hit, you pull, and um, you put a uh, compressed, you've got a cylinder, uh, compressed cylinder inside, and then you bite your flakes and it rolls out. That's another method that we use. And then we have boat reps, as you can see here. Either going down onto the boat or being recovered from the boat. Um, or, as swimmers, the aircraft comes, the chopper comes even a little bit lower than that, slows down a little, and you just step out with your wetsuits on and your fins on, and everything goes fine. But um, I don't know, General, if you remember Smitty, um, he, was, he was sort of worked up and keen, he wanted to get out of this aircraft. And uh, the altitude was fine, but the pilot hadn't throttled back yet. And he, when he stepped out of that thing, it's like skipping a stone across water. <laughs> 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 he just laid in the water, he couldn't move. He wasn't that badly injured, but black and blue. Tech diving. Now we're going on to senior senior courses. Before you can become an attack diver, you've got to go through se serious uh, medical um, examinations. <laughs> serious. And that's all done in Simonstown. That's the only place now that can do your diving medicals in Simonstown at the medical center there. Once you've qualified on that, then you've got to do an O2 tolerance test. Now, in the old days, in Simonstown, when I did my first diving course, the O2 tolerance test was, you get it up in your wetsuit, your weight belt, your rebreather, your mask. They take you to the beach, and they take you for a run in down the beach, knee deep in water. You run up and down for half an hour in the heat of the day. And if you did not collapse, <laughs> because remember, oxygen, oxygen at death becomes um, toxic. We at, at Long of I decided no, but don't look at no, we, there, there must be a better way to do this. So um, what we developed was, we take the diver in a, in a, in a chamber, we take him down to 10 meters, on air, and once at 10 meters, we put him on oxygen, and then we make him do push-ups, sit-ups. And we make him um, write out a sentence, or do sums on the paper. And if he can get that right, then he's okay. 
but you should you should see somebody uh, um, in arithmetic that <laughs> 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 comes out after when these people are telling you. Oxygen affects you, everybody differently, depending on your, your weight, your, your fitness, and all the rest of it. But that's, we, we changed that. That was a better, a better method tolerance test for us. Then we would start with, once you've done your medical, you've done your, your tolerance test and you've, you've managed to get through, you do phase one, which is two weeks, which is dying in theory, with compressed air, and all your dive drills and emergency drills, and pool, then you would spend that, those two weeks in the pool, or in the dive tank. Once you, once you finish that phase, because um, I was a member of the NAWI, I was an advanced dive instructor in NAWI, um, I managed to get all of those people that passed phase one, members, they, they, got, they were issued the open water one qualification in NAWI. Then we went on to phase two, which was um, the oxygen related theory, which is totally different to compressed air. We did the dive drills, we did the emergency procedures, and we did all for, for, the, for another two weeks. We worked in the pool and in the dive tank. Now, when I say the dive tank, it's three meters deep, it's glass, and we've got a microphone system that we can. Stand on the outside, correction, sit on the outside, <laughs> and a flask of coffee, when it's done with coffee at night and in a cold, and we can speak to the diver through microphone and tell him what is it, exactly what we need him to do. And um, you've still got standby divers on the surface, should be a problem. Buddy breathing. With compressed air, we started diving before, compressed air dive. Buddy breathing, no problem. But buddy breathing with a rebreather is a total no, 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 no to the South African Navy. Even today, if you mention a buddy breathing, if you buddy, can we buddy breathe with a rebreather? They will, they, they will not have a fit. It's not allowed. But our, 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 theory, our theory was that on target, if my buddy has a problem with his set, and there's, no, there's no reason to say why he should, his set will not fail. If he has a problem, we still must finish the task and exfiltrate. Ex so we decided we were going to now develop the drill for buddy breathing on an oxygen. Now you've got, you've got levers, it's a rebreather set. Um, You've got protozoal that absorbs the CO2 from your breath. As you breathe through the protozoal, it goes into a bag and you breathe in from the bag. But if you get water in the system um, and it starts mixing with the protozoal, it starts fermenting and um, gives you a cocktail. And um, if it gets too bad, you are going to pass out. But even if it doesn't get that bad, and there's just a cup full of water in the protozoal, I can assure you, you're going to have one murray headache when you get to the surface. So what we did is we developed the drills, and um, we had no problems at all. So we can say that guys have four Ricky know what they're doing, and they can body breathe with and rebreathing, which nobody else does. Nobody. Okay, then we would go to phase phase three, which is two weeks for fresh navigation in fresh water at Clay William Dam. The reason why we use Clay William Dam is no there's no um, flow at all of water in the dam to affect the new, when you were navigation in the dam. What we would do is we'd mark, put out a marker 50 meters from the shore and from, from the point center point in the shore, point zero, we'd measure up 20 meters left, 20 meters right. And then they would have to navigate from 50 meters, day and night, to the center point. 
And obviously the ideal situation is zero. It takes time, but we get zero eventually. And then we would uh, um, lengthen the, the, the distance, 100 meters, 200 meters, 300 meters. And that's when we do the basic introduction to navigation for the guys. This is the old Carter in Clan William Dam. You know, I'm sure you would recognize some of those people. Yeah. Okay. Not only is it underwater navigation, it's also surface navigation. When the diver is dropped off, you don't drop him off at the target. When he gets in the water, goes and lays his limp. He's got to infiltrate to the target area. And depending on the tactical situation on the ground, this infiltration distance could be anything from 8 to 10 kilometers. Swimming, like that on the <coughs> surface. And once again, depending on the tactical situation, you would go on oxygen and you would start diving um, one to two kilometers away from the target or the entrance to the harbor. Okay, so that's in the service navigation. Surface navigation. This is a guy underwater by himself, which is a no-no. You always buddy up when you're on a rebreather. And here we have it. We have it the buddy pair on oxygen with a team leader with a compass. And you can see the buddy line between them. If we need a bigger team on the ground. <coughs> this is the team. These two are buddied up here. One's for Barida and the two at the back of Barida. But there is a line connecting all six of them going through the center there. So there's your navigator with the compass in the front towards the target. Now we have two scenarios as a diver. Ooh. If you're going, if you're going to the target, Target as a ship or something in the water. You stay in the water. You're in the water. <coughs> or you're going to a point on the on the coastline where you're going to have to leave the water and go to a target inland. You do not get out of the water with your sets on you. You go to a pre predetermined spot, be it um, on a pier underneath the jetty. You secure your, take your sets off, you secure it to the pier, you go off oxygen, you hold your breath, you surface, and you swim under cover to, to land, where you exit, do your job on land, come back, <coughs> run into the water, dive, hold your breath, apnea, hold your breath, go down to your sets, go into your sets, and you, you um, dive out. And this, could be anything from 10 meters to 200 meters from the coastline. In the next, in the next shot here, you will see that diver there, he's got a reel there. They've dropped their, they've dropped their they've secured their, their equipment at the seabed. They've, marked, they've hooked on the, the reel and they've swum out to shore. Now, when they come back into shore, you know, when they go back out to sea again, they have to, he has to reel in on the surface. And just, and just prior to going down, he's got to up near, hold his breath, dive down, then go on to his kit and breathe. Now, that funny bulbs there he's got, he's carrying an RPK. Now, if you can imagine the weight of an RPK, those are flotation modules that have been designed that are strapped onto the, onto the weapon and to make that weapon neutrally buoyant in the water. In other words, the one sink won't float to the surface, it will, it will just float in the water. Yeah, I just want to... Not much longer. The difference between a wharf, a key, a pier and a jetty. See why this is important later. 
a wolf and the key are parallel to the coastline. Parallel to the coastline, where a pier and a jetty go 90 degrees into the coastline. Now, the wharf and the pier are built out on, on pillars, so it's hollow underneath, whereas the key and the jetty are solid. You think we should have a huh? drive? Right? Uh, so how long do you think it's still? Yeah. So we have to do the break so we can get refreshments and see if anyone is really thirsty. Yeah. That's on the off. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Once you've, once you've got a fight, 
and you've done your navigation, you've done Sol Donna, you've gone to Simon Stell, then you go to, to Cape Town for two weeks and, and, and rehearse there. And if you've got time, you'll go to PE and rehearse there. You'll go to East London and rehearse there. Richard's Bay. Richard's Bay. So you, you're, you're afraid, you know exactly what's going on at all orders. Now, gentlemen, you must now remember that whole layout of that harbour, the bearing from there to there, the distance from there to there, the depth from there to there, you must keep in, you must have in your mind of all those harbors and pits and jetties. So you know, if I if I if I start there, if I swim for 15 minutes, I'm going to be there. You must know. And then if I have to, I must do a left-hand turn at this bearing, going parallel to that wharf over there. So everything kept in mind. So you've got to learn all of your harbors. Okay, if it's, if it's not the, the terrorists we're talking about, if it's not the ships that are running you over, the next problem we have is that. Is that. In Simon, in Simon Stone Harbor, the outer, the, outer, the outer basin, I was swimming at, diving at 8 meters. And the next thing I know, this black shadow swam over me. And it was there for a second or so. Why do you wait on the night? Why do you wait the night? Why do you wait on 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 the night? Why do Okay, this, this shot here is just methods of boarding ships on, on, on using surface craft. You've got different methods there. You've got a ladder here. You've got a climbing, climbing pole there. Okay, so you come alongside. You use your, your different methods of, of boarding the ship. And there's the team. They board it. This is a dive team. They would come in with the climbing rod there. With the hook at the top, extendable, and come alongside, surface neck on the side of the ship, hook it up, and climb up the, the ladder. This is an example of that there. They are rehearsing on the Le Pern, which is a, a fishing vessel that they've had moored outside in some of the bay. More advanced forces. Um, in, in support to the 81 courses, the diving courses, you've got diving supervisors, chamber operators, <coughs> underwater demolitions. Someone must supervise. You can't have divers in the water without supervisors and standby divers on the surface. You must have chamber, chamber operators. We have uh, six and four man chambers at Golkakut, behind the sick bay. That are, that are put on standby every time a person gets in the water. Should there be a diving incident, these changes on standby. We must do those, those courses as well. <coughs> Underwater uh, demolitions, the attack diver two, we won't talk about. And all the support courses as well. Uh, support courses in re regard to um, the tiffy, the boat tiffy. He's got to, serve, he's got to service the boat. It's like Ford, you take your, your Ford bus to the Ford dealer, they service it, but the city takes it for a test drive. Same thing with our boats. Um, we were fortunate to have a boat, we'll get onto that now, I'll show it to you. This is just um, charges that have been detonated in the water. This is a, a fishing vessel that we scuttled 15 miles out to, out to sea with a charge. This is a compass rose. It's a wooden boat. It's a double monster. Magnificent boat. Six, six
six um, cabins on the inside, luxurious. We did our, our uh, skipper's licenses, training on this, and crew, crew training on this. Used to um, travel up and down the west coast, beautiful. I could also use it for um, infiltration into the countries to the west. Obviously, we'll not have that badge on there. <laughs> All the name. Is it still in service, John? Uh, no, got rid of it. Was it given to the Navy? It's given to the Navy because uh, the stern of the, of the vessel got wood rot, so they had to cut off a meter off the back, so it's a little shorter now. <laughs> and then they, in turn, we got this one. Get more fun. Sure. So it's an ocean racer that they use for the Cape Rio. But we never used it for the Cape Rio, but we did use it on the West Coast. Um, but a number of our members did in fact do the Cape Rio race on other ships, on the vessels, similar to this. Okay, so sea survival, which I thought was excellent. Um, crayfish, burn along, Mother Creek. Which uh, I believe they don't do, they don't do survival courses anymore on the, the Lagavulin, which I think is strange, but anyway, this is the courses we did. <coughs> Getting close to the end this is Operators Corp. Only operators were allowed at Operators Corp. And we only did, went up there when it was um, medal parades, memorial parades, or anything like that. We went up to Operators Corp. <coughs> Interesting thing is, at that specific area there, way back in the sailing ship days, they used to have lookouts. There was a station there. When the sailing ship came sailing south towards Cape Town, the guy would jump on his horse and run, gallop down the coast to the south, to the next relay position, and by the time the ship got to Cape Town, they, everybody in Cape Town knew that the ship was coming down. But Operator's Cop was the point where one of the lookout points was stationed. Well, that's just our plaques. Can you just go back two pictures and explain to them that method of cooking the, the, the abalone in the, in the seaweed? Okay, that's, that's, pure, uh, that's the seaweed there. What do I call it? Uh, kelp. That was uh, the bamboo, the, the skin of the kelp. Um, you cut it off about so far from the, from the root of the, of the kelp. Your abalone, you can cut, you, you, you cut it out of the shell, cut it up into cubes, and just stuff it into the into the into the kelp there, and then you plug it with the, the stone or a, a, a twig or a branch or something like that, and you just throw it into the flames for for half an hour, 45 minutes. Just take it out. It might not, might not. Taste wise. It's not that lacquer, you should, you should have seasoning to put with it. But if you're on sea survival, but it's so tender, it makes as a pressure cooker. Kelp. Okay. okay and all, all these parades and operators cop were at after midnight. And we were very um, what's the word? Privilege to work in an area, in the training area that we had in number one. We were very environmental orientated. We always maintained the crayfish and the pearl um, levels. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> and this was a humpback whale that <coughs> swam, was entangled in a fishing net, drawn his fishing net. And it took about an hour, an hour and a half swimming with it to try and cut the net off, but eventually we got the net off it. So, environmental, we were there. Um, this is just odd photos that we're going through, R&D wise, research and development. You would think that you would get a, <coughs> get a quad, put it in the water, and drive it to shore. It had uh, big rubber balloons which just clipped onto the outside of the rims of the, of the existing wheels to 
give you the flotation and the tread on the wheel when you're going put it forward, that will that will propel you forward. This is one of the few photos that all the sergeant majors in <coughs> one, five and four are assembled. This was in Durban. Um, this is a debrief after a knock. Well, <laughs> after the debrief. <laughs> okay, and we were, Forey was known as the demo unit in Special Forces. We were always, at least two, three times a year, we were doing demos. Here we have a general and a brigadier from the British Defence Force. If you notice, the wings on his right shoulder there, he's from XS, um, 22 SAS. And after integration, you know the members? There's a whole number of things. Yeah, well, the other ones? There's a crew with now. Crew with now in the background. This is a power turn in a boat. It's unbelievable that on a, on a, on a Barracuda, you can turn that, that boat around on a, on a, on a dicky. Do a 180 degree turn. This is doing a, um, an uplift of somebody in the water. See, there's a rope attached over there. It's in the loop. <coughs> the guy's in the water, you come up to him, put his arm through the loop, throttle back, hard to port, hard to starboard, full throttle. And the boat literally turns, turns on its own axis with the gunnel going into the water, and the guy in the water just actually rolls into the, into the boat. <laughs> Barracudas again, it's 21 footer. It's a new generation. Come on, but girls love it. <coughs> this is normally, normally coming back from an operation. I won't say this is from an operation, but coming back from an operation late afternoon at sunset, you would normally launch all the boats on the strike craft and come in at sunset, and the ships will only come into the bay later on at night. Um, under cover of darkness. <coughs> this, is, this was my office. I loved it. <laughs> but let me say, in the, in the presentation, the going down of the sun, and in the morning, we will remember it. Thank you, John. And we'd like to give you a map. When you do go to this map, you can also tell you how to get done also.